Hello 6242 folks, welcome back to my basement. I'm here to redo the lecture that we just had on Thursday because unfortunately my microphone was not configured properly inside the recording software. So live and learn, I get to redo it. So we are going to be covering uh, example three, which is an introduction to general linear models. And so the first part of this that we went over in class pertains to how to import the data. These are the same example data that we have been playing with from the 2012 General Social Survey. It's a subset of people from that original database. First step is always to tell the program where to find your data set. So that is referred to right here as the definition of a programming variable. This is SAS code for file save, which works as a abbreviation, an abbreviation for this entire path when when it is invoked. So for instance, down here, the, the, the ampersand with the word file save and then a period afterward invokes this path. So basically replaces it right here. That way I can write the path out once and then refer to it elsewhere in the code. Note this extra part right here is necessary when using the virtual desktop to refer to a local directory that is outside the H server location. So anytime that you're directing virtual de desktop to access your local directory, this prefix slash slash client slash has to be on there. Then we have proc import to import the data in Excel format. It knows that it's an Excel format because of this option right here, database management system. There's all different kinds of file formats. It's going to be saved in the work temporary directory under the name example three and it's pulling data specifically from the GSS example spreadsheet within the workbook and reading in the first row as names of the variables. Since one of the variables is categorical, I am defining a labeling convention right here with proc format. So fmarry is a labeling convention. That means anytime you see a value of one, it means unmarried. Anytime you see a value of two, it means married. Down here then, I am applying that labeling convention to a variable that is called Mary. That way everywhere on the output, the variable will use the labels instead of just the values making the output easier to read. So I am inside the example three data set. So this combination right here, data and set means save as itself. I am then adding variable labels so that these extended labels will show up on the output applying the labeling format for the values of the categorical variable. And then last but not least, this is a new function. This is not something that you'll need to worry about on your homework, but it is something that you'll need to worry about in life. The purpose of this function is to subset the data to only those cases that are complete with respect to the, all the variables that are going to be included in the analysis. So in this is a built-in function. The arguments to the function inside parentheses here are variables. So what this is doing is it says, if the number missing acro across these three columns is greater than zero, then delete the cases from the data set. This is what's going to happen anyway. If you try to run an analysis with cases that have incomplete information, they will be dropped. This way, the, sub, the sample stays constant across all of the analyses, regardless of which combinations of variables are included. And as I had mentioned in class, uh, this is not the best way to address missing data for sure. Dumping cases is never a good idea if you don't have to. But to learn more about other ways of addressing missing data, you should come back to my other classes and which use likelihood-based estimation to avoid dumping cases with missing data to a greater extent. The status syntax does the same thing. First step is to tell it where your file is and then import that Excel file using import Excel. Note this option here, case preserve, means leave the names of the variables exactly as they are written in terms of uppercase versus lowercase. That is necessary to make all of the code work that is case sensitive that follows. If you remove this option, then all of the variables will be translated into lowercase when they are imported into Stata. First row then means read the variable names in the first row. And Claire means do it again if it's already in there, which is helpful if you screw something up and need to start over again. 
just as we did in PROC format in SAS, this line right here defines a labeling convention of 1 and 2 for fmary is the name of the convention. It then gets invoked down here. It gets attached to the column called mary. So fmary is the labeling convention. Mary is the name of the variable it is attached to. And that way, everywhere on the output that refers to that variable will have a 1 and a 2 uh, be written as the labels instead. And then as in SAS, we're also labeling the variables with better descriptive labels. And then selecting cases that are complete. In Stata, that is done via this egen, which is a fancier version of gen. It invokes functions such as this one, which is row missing. So n miss is saved as a variable that returns the number of missing values across these three. And then the draft statement says if somebody has more than one, uh, more than zero missing values, excuse me, then the case gets dropped. So first step in life, in dealing with a new data set, you always want to get a sense of the lay of the land. What are the summary statistics of the variables? Are they categorical? Are they quantitative? What are their ranges? That kind of thing. So for the quantitative variables in this example, which include income and education, it's income in thousands of dollars and education in years, I'm going to get summary information for those variables using proc means. N des equals three is the number of digits after the decimal, the level of precision with which to print the output. No labels, just removes the variable labels temporarily so that I could get this table to fit on a page. And then I can write out the specific statistics that I want in addition to those that are provided by default. And all of this is happening in the example three data. VAR here stands for variables. So you list the variables that you want descriptive information for. And as answered in class, this title is like a trail of breadcrumbs because in SAS, it does not echo your syntax to the output window, unlike in other programs. And so this label is used to help me orient myself as to where the uh, what the tables then are going to refer to that follow. So it's just a way to help me keep straight all the different pieces of output that are being generated by my program. I do the same thing in Stata using this display option although Stata echoes all of the syntax and messages into the same results window, so it's not strictly necessary, but I do so for, co for comparability across the code. Uh, I used a format statement to create the same level of precision in reporting the descriptive statistics for these two variables, which is then invoked here in summarize, which is the equivalent of proc means. Uh, the detail option is used to generate additional statistics, including variance. So then we have our results, 734 cases in this data set. The mean income is $17,000, 17300 to be specific. The average distance of any case from the mean is 13.7. That standard deviation squared gives us variance. And this is a number that we will see repeated in the empty model, which is uh, it, which serves to recreate the outcome variables mean and variance. So that 190 is something we'll see momentarily again. And in education, the mean years is 13.8, so something short of a, an associate's degree. And the average person is about three away from that. Um, and the squared version of that is here. Then I'm asking for histograms to get a better sense of the overall spread of values and the shape of the distribution. And this is not something you'll need to do in homework, but it's useful to know how to do in life. So I can do this in SAS via PROC univariate. There's histogram options, and I can define how the quantitative variables are values, excuse me, are bin together. So I'm saying go from 0 to 70, for instance, in increments of 5, or 0 to 20 in increments of 1. Uh, the same thing happens here with the histogram command in Stata. And in each of these cases, it looks like there's some skewness. So positive skewness for income here on the left. I'd say more like negative skewness for education on the right. Income is going to be used as our y outcome variable, whereas education is going to be used as our x predictor variable. So for predictors, 
any kind of variable can be used as a predictor. It doesn't have to be quantitative. It doesn't have to be anything. It doesn't have to have any kind of distribution. So the fact that this distribution looks sort of weird and asymmetric is not a problem. On the outcome side, so our income variable here, there's an article on your reading list I assigned about what is and isn't assumed in regression because this is a common point of misunderstanding. The outcome variable marginally, so what we're looking at here, does not have to be normally distributed to be used as an outcome in a general linear model. So that is a false assumption. What is supposed to be normally distributed is the remainder of this variable, its residuals, after factoring in the effects of the predictors. So conditionally, the leftover part of our outcome is supposed to be normal but that doesn't necessarily mean that the original outcome marginally has to be normal. So we don't know what the distribution of the residuals will look like until we fit a model. So that is uh, not something that we need to worry about to start with. But making these sorts of pictures can help point us in the direction of whether it is likely that the residuals could be normally distributed. If I started out with, say, a binary outcome variable, there's no way the residuals could be normally distributed because there's only two possible values. So something like that would definitely require a different sort of model. But for now, we can proceed with a general linear model predicting income, given that it is a quantitative variable, and it is possible that the residuals could be normal after we are all done adding predictors. To describe our categorical variable in the analysis, this is the binary variable for Mary in this example. And you can see down here, proc freak is used to summarize categorical variables or do, to generate contingency tables. Tabulate is the equivalent in Stata. And we get this table here where note that the labels that we had applied are attached so that we know that uh, most of the sample is unmarried, just over half, and the rest are married. Next comes descriptive statistics with respect to bivariate association. So I have asked for a Pearson correlation matrix as well as confidence intervals for each pair of correlations. And we discussed this in class, but it merits going over. The first value listed within each of these little cells here is the Pearson correlation coefficient. So Pearson correlation ranges between minus one and one with zero indicating no relationship. A positive correlation, such as this one here, and this one here, and this one here, these are all positive in this example, means that in general, as x increases, y is also likely to increase. So in this context, 0.38 is the correlation between income and education. So the positive correlation means people who have more education are more likely to have more income. So more education than average is associated with more income than average. The value that is underneath each of these correlations is the p-value. So the p-value is defined as the probability of observing a result as extreme or more extreme if the null hypothesis is true. The null hypothesis being tested, as indicated on the output, is that the population correlation rho is zero. So the null hypothesis in this instance is no association. So if, for instance, these two variables were drawn from a population where they were truly unassociated, correlation of zero, a correlation as large as 0.38 or larger would be obtained less than 0.01% of the time. So it is very unlikely that we would see a correlation this large if there was no correlation in the population. Our cutoff for where unlikely begins, sufficiently unlikely or unexpected, is the alpha level. So if we a priori determine alpha to be 0.05, then we would call this result significant. So put all of these words together in your mind. A significant result means it is unexpected. It means that we would reject the null hypothesis. It is unlikely that these data came from a population with a correlation of zero. The same is true for the relationship between income and Mary. As a binary variable, this is a positive correlation, 
And to know how to interpret that in the context of a binary variable, you have to know which way is up. So married is the higher of the two categories. So as X increases is the idea of people who are married relative to unmarried. So a positive correlation means that people who are married are more likely to have higher incomes. And note that this income variable is personal income, not household income. So it is still the case that married people um, make more money than unmarried people according to this correlation coefficient, which is also significant. In contrast, this correlation of 0.05 is not significant because the p-value underneath it, that is 0.16 here, that p-value is greater than 0.05. So if education and marry as a binary predictor came from a population where these two variables were unrelated, we would see a correlation of 0.05 or larger like 17% of the time. So well within expected sampling fluctuation at the sample size. So sample size of 734 as a reminder. And then down here we get each pair of variables. We get the sample correlation repeated and we get 95% confidence limits around it that describe its precision. And these are um, the result of a Fisher's R to Z transformation that is done for you to get these boundaries. And then the p-values from up here are repeated. Same thing happens in Stata. The PW core command, which stands for pairwise correlations. Uh, we have the, the three variables listed and I've requested the p-value that goes with it. And so the first value in this table is the correlation coefficient. The second is the p-value. And note that in SATA, P is not actually zero, it's zero to four decimal places. So it would be less than 0 0.0001, the same as what is reported as such in SAS. So it's useful to know to what extent your variables are related to each other bivariately, so within each pair, in trying to anticipate what's going to happen when these variables are included together in a model. So in this example, we are only going to have one predictor at a time, but we would want to know in models that have more than one predictor to what extent those predictors are correlated. If the predictors are related to each other, then each of their relationships when placed in the same model will be different than the relationships when each is considered in isolation. So we'll be talking more about that in lecture five in a few weeks. And then here's the uh, CI2 module that you can install that gives confidence intervals around these correlations as well. You have to request each pairs separately. Okay, I am paranoid that my microphone is not on, so I'm checking again. It appears to be working. Let's hope that I'm right. So then starting on page four, the new stuff. Our very first general linear model is right here. This is the worst possible model you could ever have. It's what's known as an empty model because it has no predictors. So the only terms that are in here is this beta zero. This is my fixed intercept. The fixed intercept, fixed because it is a constant, everybody gets the same. Intercept, the definition is always the same. The intercept is the expected value for the outcome when the predictors in the model are zero. If there's no predictors in the model, it's just the expected value for the outcome, which is its mean. So beta zero is going to recreate the sample mean for our variable of income. E, this term, each person has one E value, that's why it's E sub i, that is known as the model residual. Uh, e also stands for error, although I don't like that term as much because it seems to imply you've done something wrong, whereas in reality, people simply differ from each other for unknown reasons. So it's not an error, it's just individual differences. But the E residual is always defined the same way as well. It is the distinction, the difference, between the outcome that is that was observed in the data and the outcome that was predicted by the model. So it's the data minus the prediction, it makes E. So if you are somebody who is above the mean, your E is gonna be a positive number from the empty model. If you're somebody who is below the mean, your E will be 
a negative number. And what we care about in the context of these models is not what each person's individual E is, but their variance across people. And the variance of... Uh-oh. <laughs> I accidentally hit my standing desk. Sorry about that. Okay, back down. There we go. Uh, the variance across people in the E residuals is known as residual variance. And if there's no predictors in the model, such as we have right here, that's going to be all of the variance in the outcome. So this model doesn't really serve a purpose in terms of an analysis, but it is useful pedagogically to illustrate what the baseline is for these analyses. This is the starting point. All of the variability that there is to be predicted in income is represented by this model. And then we can see what happens to that variability, how it gets reduced as we add predictors that are related to income. So here is your introduction to our first general linear model, first in SAS, space there, PROC GLM. Just like all the other PROCs, you need to tell it what data set it goes with. This name len option is just something that I added to keep it from truncating names of long variables. We have model, and after that, you fill in the values of the variables first that you want as your outcome, and then after the equal sign would be the values of the predictors. So in this spot right here is where they would go. So it kind of looks like the equation in that you have y equals and then whatever is going to be predicted by it. You don't have to refer to beta zero. It is included by default. All models have a fixed intercept included that you don't have to refer to. Conceptually, you can think of it as applying to a variable that is just a column of ones. So everybody has a beta zero that contributes equally to their predicted score. In SAS, the slash is used to denote options. So extra things to be displayed or not. Uh, the word solution is here because believe it or not, it's not a default to actually show you the results of the model fixed effects. So I added that. And then alpha equals 0.05 paired with CL parm. CL parm means confidence limits of the parameters. And with an alpha of 0.05, that means that I'm asking for a 95% confidence limit. So alpha and confidence are the opposites of each other. Last but not least, to close the procedure and make it go, you need both run and quit each uh, terminated with the semicolon. I know it seems redundant, but it's actually not. And then finally, this title serves to shut off this title after it is used. That way it doesn't keep printing indefinitely across results that have nothing to do with this analysis. And then Stata, the title is here. Regress is the command that we'll be using for all general linear models in Stata. The first word after it is your outcome variable, and there's nothing after it. The comma separates out options, so the fact that there's no other variables listed in here means that it's an empty model, so that's where the predictors would normally go. And level 95 corresponds to a 95% confidence interval, which I believe is a default, but I included here for completeness. So the output for GLM is a lot more uh, voluminous than this. I have cut it down to just the parts that we need to pay attention to. And for the purposes of this example, in which we have only one predictor in the model, uh, no predictors yet, but working up to one, the only thing that we need to pay attention to with respect to these first two sets of these two tables is right here. So that value in the column labeled mean square and in the row labeled error in Stata, it's in the column labeled MS, which stands for mean square, and the row labeled residual. So again, error and residual are synonyms. That value is the variance of the E sub I residuals from the model. Given that I have no predictors, the residual variance of 190 matches the variance of income that we saw in proc means a couple pages ago. So the 190 that we got so that is just being recreated by this empty model. That is as much variability in income as there is in the data. So conceptually, 190 represents a numerical summary 
of all the reasons why some people make more money than others. It's our job then to figure out why that might be the case by including predictors. So one of the parameters in the model is the variance of the E sub I residuals, that's the 190, and the other is right here. So this is the solution for fixed effects. The intercept, which is beta zero here, so I've labeled it as such out here, this is just the mean of income. So if you don't know anything else about a person, your best guess as to what their outcome value would be is the outcomes mean. So 17.3 is the sample mean, just like we saw in prop means. Standard error of the mean is right next to it. So this is referring to the expected inconsistency of this sample intercept estimate across repeated samples of the same size. The standard error is how far off on average the samples version of the fixed intercept would be from the population version of the fixed intercept. So it is the same thing as the standard error of the mean in this case. So as standard deviation, which is actually rep repeated right here, standard deviation is how far off on average any cases from the sample mean Standard error is how far off on average any sample's value is from the population value. So every fixed effect in these models is going to have a separate standard error estimated for it. And if I take this estimate of 17, divide by its standard error, that converts into a t-test statistic, or a t-value as it is known. And in this case, that t corresponds to a significant p-value, but we don't really care because what that is telling us is that the sample mean is significantly different than zero. Of course it is. We wouldn't expect people to make no money on average. And so here's the confidence interval around that sample mean estimate. It clearly does not include zero, so that's why we have a p-value here that would be uh, reported as significant. Stata's output looks very much the same, except for these two tables are squished into one section. In the solution for the fixed effects, we have differences in how it gets labeled. So estimate in SAS corresponds to coefficient in Stata. Standard error corresponds to STDERR. T value corresponds to T, and the label for P looks pretty much the same. And again, this p-value is not zero, it's zero to three decimal places. And then the confidence interval at the end here. Stata labels the fixed intercept differently. It's this underscore cons thing. I hate that actually, it stands for constant. Um, in a sort of traditional algebra, sort of y equals mx plus b, you know, b would be the constant. I think that's where the language comes from. However, all fixed effects including slopes, are constants. So to me, that's an ineffective way of labeling it, but no one asked me. Uh, Stata will continue to display the intercept with this label as constant throughout all of its routines, and the constant is always labeled last in the table, whereas it, the intercept is always first in SAS. So there'll be slight differences in the output because of those things. So then we added on page five, a predictor for education. So note that education also has a sub i because it varies over individuals. Its slope, beta one, does not because it is a constant. So the fixed slope beta one is a constant estimated by the model. All fixed slopes have the same interpretation. It is the difference in y for a one unit difference in x. So we will get a coefficient that tells us to what extent income increases for each additional year of education. So education as my new predictor goes after the equal sign in the model statement, just like it does in the equation. That's the only difference in the SAS code. And in Stata, education goes after the outcome variable of income before the comma that sets off the options for printing. The impact of adding education is shown by a reduction of the residual variance for the model. So this used to be 190, it's down to 162. So part of the reason why some people make more money than others 
is because of their education level. And after accounting for that reason, 162 is the variance in income that remains. So the idea of residual leftover variance. Um, for those of you who've had regressions before, you'll recognize this idea of reduction in variance as R square. So we'll talk more about this in the next unit, but R square is the proportion reduction in the variance. So relative to 190, the variance has been reduced by about 15% down to 162. In your homework, for every model that you run, I am going to first ask for this number right here, the mean square error or residual variance. That is because that number tells me if you have the right information in your model, the right outcome variable and the right predictor variables. So I ask that first as a check to let you and I know that you're on the right track. You can think of this as an identification of your model, sort of like a, a VIN on your vehicle. Um, you know, the 20 digit number that is on the uh, inside your window or inside the door in some vehicles that your car dealer or, you know, oil change places and those kinds of things would refer to to identify your car. You can think of this as the, as the, the VIN for the model, so to speak. So then what happened? Well, we reduced our variance from 190 to 162. And now we have two parameters listed in our table of fixed effects. We have the intercept from before and we have our new slope for education. So the slopes estimate is 1.82. So for every additional year of education, predicted income increases by 1.82, so about $1,800 more per year of education. Just like the intercept had a standard error before, the slope has a standard error. The definition is parallel. A standard error is always how far off on average the sample version of a, uh, of a value is from the population version. So in this case, it's the standard error of the slope. Our slope will be off from the population slope on average by 0.16 across samples. So it's the expected inconsistency of the slope value across samples. That's what the standard error is telling us. So if we have our estimate of 1.82, we divide it by its standard error of 0.16, that returns our t value. So this is our t test statistic, whose job is to standardize this slope onto a common distribution where the mean is the null hypothesis and the standard deviation is given by the standard error. So what this t of 11 is telling us is that our slope estimate is 11 standard errors away from the null hypothesis. Conventionally, unexpected in terms of uh, where p less than 0.05 starts is roughly two standard errors above or below the mean, so 11 definitely puts us into significant unexpected territory. So we would say that this slope estimate of 1.82 is a positive slope and it is a significant slope because of the p-value. So the sign comes from the estimate. The decision about whether it's significant or not comes from p less than 0.05, less than alpha more generally. And it has confidence limits. This confidence limit does not include zero. And so that's another way of saying that we would reject the null hypothesis. It is sufficiently unlikely that this slope came from a population with a true zero slope, the null hypothesis. So that's all fine, but then look what happened to the intercept. The intercept used to be about 17, if memory serves. Yeah, 17.3. It is now negative seven. So let me try and put both of these onto the screen at the same time. The first term in the solution for fixed effects and the last term in Stata are the same idea. This is the fixed intercept. The fixed intercept always has the same definition. It is the expected y value when the predictors are zero. So the reason why we have a predicted income of negative $7,000 is because this is the predicted income for someone with education equals zero, which we don't even have in our sample. 
So this is a problem of interpretation. It isn't a problem in terms of the regression solution because this regression solution, the intercept and the slope for education, it predicts the expected value of income for any level of education. But it is weird to think about having a negative intercept when you couldn't possibly have a negative value of income. So we're going to fix it by a linear transformation of the predictor in, in which we subtract a constant so that zero is now within the scale of the predictor. That's what's known as centering. So here's a picture of the problem. The intercept of minus seven is out here because that's where the line crosses the y-axis at x at zero. So the way that we fix it is to redefine a new variable for education in which zero refers to 12 years. So we have to first manually create that new variable inside the data set. So the combination in SAS of data plus set means save as itself. You have to do that in SAS because you can refer to more than one data set at a time in SAS. The new variable then is before the equal sign. The variable used to create it is after the equal sign. So there is currently a column called EDUC. When I subtract 12 from it, I'm telling it to save the result as a brand new column that has the name EDUC 12. This is a convention that I personally use in all of my examples. I save the centering constant at the end of the new variable's name. That way, when I see the output, I always know immediately what the reference point is for any variable. So that new version of education centered at 12 is what goes into the model here in SAS, and we'll do the same thing in SATA. So with respect to the results, the residual variance is exactly the same because it is an equivalent model. The slope is exactly the same because it's the same information creating the expected difference in income per year of education. It's a linear transformation, so we haven't distorted education in any way. What has changed as a result of centering the predictor is the fixed intercept because the intercept is always the expected value of the outcome when x is zero now this pertains to somebody with an education level of 12 years. That person has a predicted income of $14,000. So we've moved the reference point for education to be here in the middle, and it's still the same regression line going through the data. So the intercept is the you are here sign, because that's the idea. We didn't talk about these yet in class, and so I will skip those for now. Nor did we talk about these pictures yet, but I did just want to point out the similar code in Stata. So we first need to create a new variable that is education 12 with the word gen for generate in front of it. And then that new variable goes into the analysis and it still has the same slope and the intercept has changed to 14 just as it did in the SAS output. All right. So I believe that catches us up to where we left off on Thursday. I hope to see everybody next week, and I hope to have my recording work correctly then. So thank you, and I'll see you then.